Good morning, everyone, and a prospero año y felicidad. So this morning, we will be looking at Luke chapter 4 at the beginning, 13 verses known as the temptation of Christ. So if you're there now, I'll read. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Father, thank you this morning for your word and let us consider it in our hearts, Lord, what you have to say to us, not only about your sinless, faithful, perfect father obeying son, but also in our own hearts, Lord, how you might speak to our hearts our minds, our souls this morning and turn us, Lord, towards you to worship you with those hearts. So this portion of Luke comes after Jesus goes to the Jordan and is baptized. The Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form and the father declares, you are my beloved son with you. I am well pleased. And after this three-part temptation of Jesus, he begins his ministry through all the surrounding country. So the larger context here in these beginning portions of Luke shows us Jesus is in fact the Christ. He is born into a troubled world where most sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, not yet having been given the knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of sins. It's a world ruled by Herod, who does so by all kinds of evil. Mary is told the baby she will bear will be called the son of God. Zechariah prophesies redemption has come. A horn of salvation is raised up. The angels in the field are told a savior is born. Simeon in the temple holds this baby saying he has now seen the Lord's salvation. John the Baptist tells us he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So this Jesus is definitely the Christ, the scriptures tell us. And this Jesus is appointed for a sign to be opposed. So let's start by noting what is of utmost importance for us guilty sinners, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, he must be sinless so he can die for our sins and he must defeat the devil. And indeed his temptation in the wilderness will show Jesus is the one qualified 
to be tempted in every respect as we are, yet without sin, that he is indeed a lamb without blemish or spot. And when his work is finished, it is finished through his death and resurrection, he will destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. In fact, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. This severe temptation of Christ here will reveal and confirm Jesus does not sin. Jesus only does what he sees the Father doing. He makes judgments only as he hears from the Father. He does only his Father's will, as Jesus declares in John's Gospel. And this extreme trial, temptation of Christ, confirms his obedience to the Father's will, which is actually the same will as the second person of the Trinity, even though, as Jesus lives through his ministry in Israel, it will result in severe suffering, as it does here. These temptations will show how Jesus is the opposite of rebellious Israel, overcoming where the Jews failed. It will show us when Jesus is being obedient to the Father, he uses the scriptures to make his case, and it will show Jesus came to serve, not to be served. Throughout these three temptations, Jesus quotes scriptures from Deuteronomy, a book which has much to say about disobedience, that of Israel in the desert. In their case, the people failed in obedience. Jesus triumphs. Meanwhile, we can compare our passage in Luke to another time of disobedience versus obedience and the stark contrast between the two. Here, Jesus will fast and be hungry. Recalling Adam, he had plenty to eat, nothing about fasting. Adam could eat from any tree in the garden, excepting one, of course, but Jesus had none. Adam lived in a spectacular paradise with Eve while Jesus was alone in the wilderness. The devil triumphed fully over Adam and Eve to sin, but is a total failure in tempting Jesus to do so. Perhaps for some, including myself, it's difficult to truly comprehend the extent of the suffering of this man in the wilderness during this temptation. Our daily thoughts are of Jesus, triumphant, risen, exalted to the heavens, ruling and reigning from there in his glory with the Father, hearing our prayers and upholding the universe. But here, as at Gethsemane, the temptation and suffering are extreme for the Son of God who came in the flesh. So, our passage begins very succinctly. Jesus now full of the Holy Spirit after his baptism and is led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, a desolate and unpleasant wilderness, maybe like this, a great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there is no water. As God describes a wilderness in the Old Testament, not that same wilderness, but we can be sure it's nothing like a lonely hike in the Sierras. As Mark tells us, he was with the wild animals. His life there will consist of being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. As our passage tells us, he will be tempted to distrust the Father, to presume upon the Father's actions, and to worship a created being. But as he begins his ministry, he is ready for this testing, full of the scriptures and the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit into this wilderness. He is tempted and he triumphs. And so Jesus has been through 40 days of fasting and is hungry. Then the devil appears in the narrative. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command the stone to become bread. Excellent idea. If you want to cause trouble, go to a man who 
voluntarily hasn't eaten in 40 days and tempt him to eat. Of course, eating bread when you're hungry is not sinful in itself, but the way to eat, as the devil suggests, otherwise known as tempts, is the problem. For a minute, let's note how the devil starts out with if. If you are the son of God. Those are the same words the mockers used at the cross when mocking Jesus. But those mockers did not think he was the son of God. Here, the devil knows so fully and obviously. There's no doubt here. It's like asking Einstein, if you're so smart, do my math homework for me. And what is Jesus' answer? And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. In the parallel passage in Matthew, he adds to this, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This response takes us back to Deuteronomy as to all of Jesus' responses in these temptations. There in chapter 8, for this first temptation, we see the Lord reminding the Israelites of the 40-year testing in the wilderness as they are just about to enter the promised land. The Lord says those 40 years happened in part that he might humble them, testing them to know what was in their heart. Were you going to obey or, or not? There, the Israelites were hungry. And in that testing, God, God did give them manna, bread from heaven. In all this, God says that he may make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so Jesus responds like that to Satan's temptations. God gave the Israelites bread only at his appointed time. The Father will provide Jesus bread to sustain him and continue his life at the right time. Actually, for all creation, which must have food to survive, what they need to sustain life even more is for God to simply sustain them with the breath he first gave them. Like Psalm 104, speaking of all creation and how God waters and sustains the earth and living beings like us. God says, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. And when God does so, we are sustained for a time. But then the psalm goes on. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. And so Jesus is not going to be independent of the Father but trust God will bring about things at the right time, whatever it may be, food or no food, trusting the commands from his father as he lives on earth. Living like this, proclaiming during his final earthly discourse in John as he leaves the supper room about to go to the cross so that the world may know that I love the father, I do exactly as the father commanded me. And so the devil moves on to the second temptation and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Now exactly how the devil did this not sure, probably some type of a, a vision. So Jesus has the opportunity, according to the devil, to have all the kingdoms and authority over them, all powerful. So as the devil often does, he tries to mix a bit of truth and a lot of lie together. The devil is a confirmed narcissist. Maybe even in self-delusion, he believes as he speaks his own lies, which of course is the native language he always uses. Yes, the devil is the prince of the power of the air at present, 
taking people captive to do his will along with his demonic assistance. But ultimate authority, no. Jesus rebukes demons as his earthly ministry goes on. They fear him, thus realize their ultimately limited power. By Jesus, the prince of the air will be driven out. He has no hold on Jesus. The devil stands condemned when it is finished. So in the first temptation, Jesus was tempted to distrust God's provision that sustenance to survive comes only upon the Father's timing, something that remind, might remind us, but seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Here in the second temptation, he is tempted to seize power and authority over all, all power, all wealth, all glory, all fame of the world to join in a different false authority, abandon the Trinity, break the first of the Ten Commandments, join a temporary authority, which Satan possesses. And of course, to avoid the upcoming suffering of a suffering servant. Satan will give all these things under one condition, to worship him. And Jesus responds again, based upon what God declares in Deuteronomy is... It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Once again, Jesus is determined to do only what the Father tells him. So then, the devil moves on to the third temptation. Jesus is at a very familiar and much-loved place, the temple in Jerusalem. Good location for a temptation. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. So the devil is using two different scriptures to make his plea to Jesus doubling up for this last temptation. And the devil has heard Jesus up to now using scriptures and responding to his temptations. So now the devil uses the same idea for this third temptation. He tries using scriptures to support the temptation. Once again, from Deuteronomy and also from Psalm 91. And the devil quotes them fairly accurately. One might even insist well, you know, the Bible does say that. Of course, the misuse of scriptures to rationalize sin is not uncommon. The devil's twisted logic saying to Jesus, you should trust the father to protect you. Meanwhile, your position as his son would be confirmed by this amazing public miracle and the wonderful goodness of the father would be confirmed and displayed as well. But Jesus doesn't do great public miracles to be famous and loved for it. That's not his life. As we see, as Luke goes on for the next 24 chapters, something like in Isaiah, no form or majesty, we should look at him as one from whom men hide their faces, coming to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So here, the devil is tempting Jesus to essentially back God into a corner, presume upon the Father's goodness to perform a miracle, to test God in spite of what he might have commanded. So can we note that just before our passage begins, Luke gives the long genealogy of Christ, and it ends with the son of Adam, the son of God. And we can see another shadow of Adam's failure versus Christ's triumph here as the devil tempts Jesus to jump, really to die if the father doesn't intervene. You shall not surely die, the devil said to Eve with Adam there back in the garden. So those two put the Lord 
to the test. No trust, no self-denial and control. Instead, presumption that even though what God said no to, somehow it would really work for the good for those two. But here, Jesus responds very differently to the devil with scripture. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, it's a response from Deuteronomy where the verse is, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. The at Massa there in Deuteronomy refers back to Exodus where they had left Egypt and the manna had begun to come down from above. But then the people complained of no water, they quarreled with Moses, began to question whether the Lord was really among and for them. Did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? And here for Jesus, the temptation is not to trust the Father's promises. Maybe the Father won't care for me like a father should. Perhaps I will put my father to the test in a situation of my choosing, so he must take that care, prove his promise. But the father had already very recently confirmed his loving relationship with Jesus at his baptism. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so the next verse in Deuteronomy, after reminding them of their lack of trust at Massa, fits well. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And so Jesus, he only does what the Father commands him, what he hears from the Father. So then, this wilderness time for Jesus comes to an end. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. So temptations are not at all finished for Jesus. There will be many more, as Luke tells us later. After the Last Supper and on the way to Gethsemane, in the final hours with his disciples, Jesus says to them, you are those who have stayed with me in my temptations, in his trials, as the greatest trial will now come in the garden on the way to the cross. And finally, as Matthew adds in his account at the end of these temptations, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him, ministering to a man extremely weak from 40 days of fasting, temptations, and trials. And so ends the temptations. Jesus is ministered to by those angels after those 40 days of fasting. And he will now begin his ministry to the people, just as the Father has commanded. John the Baptist prepared the way. The baptism itself was visited by the Father to declare Jesus as his son. The genealogy just before the temptations ties Jesus' human genealogy back to Adam. And the overcoming of the devil's temptations prove he is the righteous, sinless, obedient, father-obeying, faithful son of God. So now, can we note the simplicity of Jesus' words to the devil throughout the temptations? Jesus replies to the devil, but he doesn't argue. He replies with scriptures. That's it. No squabbling, just scriptural truths which are, importantly, consistent with the situation and its context. Jesus grew up learning the scriptures in detail. We get a glimpse of this when he is 12 at the temple. So when the fierce temptations come, he is fully armed with the sword of the spirit ready to counter attack. The lesson for us should be obvious. Strive to be equally armed no sheathed sword in the trunk to retrieve and prepare after fumbling with the keys, but belted right to our side each hour as we go through the day. 
But note, just having a head full of scripture doesn't guarantee its proper use just by spouting it. The devil himself in the third temptation quoted the scriptures fairly accurately to tempt Jesus. Throw yourself down from here, and the scriptures say it will work out well for you. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, <clears throat> thinking of our modern churches and the culture, a couple of popular fantasies come to mind for some with itching ears who quote words from Jesus. From 1 John, for example. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. So do love, be love, and support the loving thing, whatever one's loving heart may decide that is, because love is love. And so judge not that you not be judged. That's a good idea. Don't spend too much time judging love is love because your brain may also become a vacuum like the logic behind that one. And of course, we pray. Pray regarding temptations. The Lord's Prayer, as short as it is, ends with, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And of course, the final great trials of Jesus' life here on earth, reminding us of the intensity of his three temptations in the wilderness, Gethsemane. My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. And there he prays, succeeding there as he did in the wilderness, doing the Father's will. This time, not to the point of possibly starving to death, but to death, even death on a cross. And recall, even in that greatest point of trial for Jesus, he ministers to his disciples about this very same thing. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. This is spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, often very weak. So Jesus says, watch and pray. So one obvious point of our sermon today is to think about our weak flesh and how each of us is tempted including via besetting sins, often widely varying types and degrees of temptations. But it seems good at this point to consider how James lays it out for us. He starts out rather bluntly. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now that same root word trials is also very, very often used for temptations used in the Lord's Prayer and here in our wilderness text this morning and also at Gethsemane. This word is rendered temptations, which it's fair to say are definitely trials as it is here in James. And then James goes on. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Jesus continued to be truly perfect, sinless after his wilderness temptations and trials. We, not so much. But for the ongoing trials and temptations for we believers, hopefully mostly with victory by sticking with the scriptures, are from James' point of view, primarily a testing which results in steadfastness, and thus we avoid becoming dull of hearing, as we learned in Hebrews, as we love the solid food of the mature. From Hebrews, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. So as we begin to come near the end, I note again a mistake I've made in the past when reading the historical account of Jesus' three temptations was to make too light of it by thinking 
Well, he is God, you know, way stronger than I am. But we can recall C.S. Lewis and his take on temptation, that none of us know how bad he is until he has tried very hard to be good. The one who fully resists all temptations to the uttermost, that would be Jesus, the sinless one, never yielding to it, is the one who knows most how incredibly strong it can be. So I also make the mistake thinking, well, the devil is saying ridiculous things. Stone to bread? That one makes sense. But worship the devil? Can't fathom that one. Throw down from the temple? Seems crazy. But my mistake is downplaying the suffering humanity of Christ in those 40 days of fasting alone in the wilderness. This man who had to be made like his brothers in every respect, just like it is difficult to understand the suffering horrors of the cross, the torturous evil done that day to the one born of a virgin, the one being found in human form, the sinless son of God crucified while the full wrath of his father was being poured out on his son for the sins of his chosen believers, a wrath so great it is manifested in eternal hell for unbelievers. It's not the suffering of the cross, but it really is unimaginable to grasp the extent of Jesus' suffering and survival through temptations those weeks in the wilderness. And it was God's plan and will to try his son with those temptations after Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. Just as our later crucified Savior was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. All three wilderness tests require standing on God's promises as revealed. And thinking about that third temptation, not putting the Lord your God to the test or call it backing God into a corner or being presumptuous. I'm reminded of the widow in the temple who makes an offering. Jesus is sitting there watching rich people put in large sums. Then the widow puts in coins worth about a penny. Jesus says of her, she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Is she living dangerously, putting in all she had to live on? Is she putting the Lord her God to the test, being presumptuous, taking one of God's promises out of context, so to speak? That third temptation, jumping from the temple for God to rescue, because according to the lying devil, God apparently says he would rescue. That's a lack of trust toward God's care by testing him in that sinful way. Here, the widow is showing her trust in God for his care. Jumping from the temple is unbelief masquerading as faith. I'm not sure God will care for me, so to be sure, I will force God to do so on my terms. The widow is saying, I do think God will care for me, so I stand correctly on his promises. Perhaps she was remembering, as Paul quoted in 2 Corinthians, while speaking of trusting God as a cheerful giver, she was remembering Psalm 112, as Paul did. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. This widow had counted the cost and trusted a promise without sinful presumption testing God. And so I, we must be careful not to presume and test God, but carefully understand what each promise revealed in Scripture really means. Really, all the temptations here are about trusting God's promises. Temptations to enter into activities that would show a lack of trust toward God's care. Would Jesus trust his Father's provision 
for basic needs? Was the father in first priority rather than going after the world by switching allegiances? When Jesus trusts God will protect him without a staged test, doing God's will, walking rightly with God through suffering and self-denial. Not equating Jesus' suffering to our usual life issues, but when it comes to stoned bread, we have a felt need. We are hungry, are needy for something, and ask God to provide it. But maybe he doesn't. We may be tempted to turn the stone to bread ourselves, not be content with what the Lord does about it, go around him being sinful to satisfy our need. Assuming upon his grace and forgiveness to test the limits, should I wonder if my temptations are from the devil or just my sinful nature doing what it does best? I'll just always assume it's me, my problem, and pretty much ignore him. Keep praying and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, including the evil one. And so Jesus will now begin his ministry to the people of Israel and end at the cross. John the Baptist has prepared the way for the coming Messiah. Jesus' genealogy shows us he has the ancestral roots for his kingly role. Jesus is the hope of all people. He is baptized and declared to be God's beloved son. Jesus is sinless, righteous, and faithful, as shown by his 40 days in the wilderness. So Jesus begins. He goes home to Nazareth. He is the anointed one. He proclaims the good news for the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. It is the year of the Lord's favor for all clothed in filthy rags of their own personal righteousness. Fulfilled at their hearing, he is the good news. And so he goes on living sinlessly, doing good everywhere, then dying in horror under his father's wrath, wrath due us, including for our yielding to sinful temptations to fulfill our latest felt need. Fortunately, our believing, repentant, sin-confessing heart, mind, and soul are saving faith in this one and only Son of God saves us from that wrath's final outcome working in eternal damnation. So, as we begin this new year, let's, us believers, put one foot in front of the other as we walk through what can readily be called a shadowed valley of death created by raging nations and rulers and peoples plotting, ultimately in vain, against the Lord and his anointed, saying with glee, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us, honing, perfecting, and celebrating the latest God-belittling treachery, flooding the culture with heaps of sin and thus many temptations. So for us, we shall be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. The mighty power of this one who was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. What power is that? The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe no temptation has overtaken each of us that is not common to all. He always provides the way of escape. We can endure. We can live for righteousness because by his wounds, we believers have been healed. <clears throat> so, 
So, Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, for reminding us again of the suffering servant, the one who would be made in all ways like his brothers, the one who left his glorious, unfathomably awesome, spectacular place in heaven with this father, Lord, and came down to be with the sinners of the world. Lord, people just like us, lost, unbelieving, and on their way to hell. And yet, God, because of your unfathomable, amazing mercy, you became one of us, tempted in every way, proved without any doubt that you are the sinless, father-obeying son of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so, Lord, we thank you for strengthening us, Lord, as we begin this new year, that we might walk humbly and rightly before you, Lord, with that sheathed sword belted right to our side, Lord, that we may wield it, Lord, as the temptations of the decaying culture around us become ever, ever greater, Lord. So we know, Lord, that you are sovereign. All things are in your hands. And so we commit ourselves to follow you and glorify you as we do this morning and all that we do. And as we go from here to continue, Lord, to obey and love and worship our great, beautiful, awesome King Jesus. Amen.